First off, thank you all for coming and joining us today. Uh, I'm excited that I think it's a great topic and we have some great folks on our panel and uh, we'll do some quick introductions here in a moment. I do want to thank our sponsor. Ben is not able to attend this morning, but uh, Ben Tice from School of Marketing is one of our sponsors here. So we're thankful for their partnership um, and we're thankful for Rush Creek giving us a beautiful view of the golf season and make me want to go hit golf balls really badly uh, after, we, after we get done. So again, thanks for coming. So we have our salad here and our main entree will follow here in a moment. And without further ado, I'll, do, I'll start us off with some quick introductions and then we'll go from there. Um, so I'm Rob Stark, I'm with uh, Edward Jones. And one of the things I wanted to do when I built my practice out is really partner with small business and entrepreneurs. So, uh, I got excited. I'm, I'm thankful that uh, Rick and Lucas got a chance to join us here this afternoon. Um, but I got a chance to partner with Club E. I loved what they were doing in Minneapolis. So trying to bring some of those things out from the city, out here to the, uh, uh, the western suburbs of, of the city. So we're thankful for that partnership. So uh, with that, we'll start off with Peggy. Okay. I'm Peggy Reimer. I'm Vice President of Human Resources with Midwest Dental. We're a dental support organization. So we affiliate with private practice uh, doctors who are looking to sell uh, their practices to us. Um, we run the back office functions, all the administrative functions for the practice while the doctor continues to focus on the clinical aspects of their practice. So I've been with them for about two and a half years. Prior to that, I was in HR uh, pretty much my whole career and more focused on healthcare. So. My name is Brandon Reinschmidt. I'm with a CPA firm, um, SDK CPAs. We are located out of Minneapolis. We are a 75 person firm. Um, we do all the traditional accounting services with tax, um, audit, insurance work. We also have a forensic and accounting um, uh, services group that does litigation support and business valuations. Um, our firm, I guess I would, we have a lot of, a lot of our clients are family businesses. Uh, we do a lot of nonprofit work. Um, one of the corny stories that our, our firm used to tell recruits when, when I first started was think of, think of us like the Goldilocks and Three Bears. We're not too big, we're not too small, we're kind of just right. Um, you know, we, serve, we can serve big clients, we can serve small clients, but we can still give them um, you know, uh, customized services too. And I work on the, sorry, I work on the, the audit um, assured side, but I do business valuations and assist with our friends accounting group as well. And I'm Jim Snoxell from Henningsen and Snoxell. We're a law firm in Maple Grove, although our clientele comes from across the metropolitan area and outstate as well. I happen to chair the firm's business law and nonprofit organization practice group. Uh, we've uh, got, what, 17 attorneys, about 32, 33 overall people. So we're kind of not too big, not too small as well. Uh, and in fact, one of my colleagues uh, who handles our creditor's remedies practice is the son of the Dockin, who was uh, uh, one of the name, original name partners of your accounting firm. So we're a full service firm. We have you know, family law attorneys, a personal injury, and workers' compensation counsel. Um, you name it, we do it. In the business world, uh, you know, we cover the gamut, uh, everything from contracts to ownership disputes, uh, buying and selling of businesses, um, working with franchisors and in some cases even franchisees. So it's a full service package that we bring for our clients. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and uh, my first question that, uh, that we had was for Jim and Peggy. So surrounding, there was a lot of, um, in the HR circles, a lot of confusion around the wage theft legislation that came through here in July. It kind of came up suddenly and when it did, there was a lot of what do we really need to do to be compliant. So if you guys could share some best practices or experiences that, and insights that you might have, that'd be great. Sure, I'll give it a start. Um, the new legislation has, well, okay, every once in a while my bias will shine through, um, an attempt to criminalize the historic contractual, private contractual relationship between employer and employee is kind of annoying, especially as a business attorney. But I guess that's the reality of the modern world, and I do have to admit there has been an amazing amount of what we now call employee wage theft, where you know companies go under or they just choose not to pay people. And some of the statistics that were thrown out in all of that debate, it's pretty astounding. 
the, the wage theft law that we're now dealing with boils down to, I think, three kind of principal groups of issues. One are all the different notices that we have to give frequently and often. Uh, another is the record keeping requirement, which I won't name names, but I do know plenty of clients, despite our best efforts, are not yet quite up to sync in terms of the record keeping that they have to do under the new laws. And what's gotten the media attention is the potential criminal liability for uh, non-payment of wages. Uh, the word intent was slipped in there, and the good Lord only knows what that will turn out to be determined by the courts to mean. And I assure you one of our principles is don't let your client become a test case, because that's really a losing proposition. So, um, Peggy, but you, how about if I talk a little bit about the notices and turn the rest over to you. Um, the core requirement now is that employees receive a kind of statutorily defined set of notices when they are hired and when some of their terms of employment change. So there's still going to be a, people who write our statutes are not necessarily the best writers and they don't think everything through, so there's a lot of ambiguity here. But we do know for sure that when an employer hires somebody, they not only have to give them a shake, a shake of the hand, and uh, if they use a written employment agreement, have one, but we have to give a separate notice that deals with things like your rate of pay, uh, whether you're being paid weekly, bi-weekly, whether you're being paid a salary or you're paid, paid on commission, all the details about how you're being paid. We have to make a statement as the employer to our employees about whether they are exempt from wage and hour legislation or not, and it's really a good idea to give them the right advice on that subject. Um, there's some new regulations that are kicking in on the first of the new year that go to changing the standards for determining who's exempt and who isn't, which may be something we talk about as well. Um, we do have to give details about the deductions that will be taken from somebody's wages, and that ranges from FICA and the medical assistance tax uh, down to the employee benefit costs that the employees are taking. So we have to give them all of those details. And by the way, well, my read the statute is saying any time that changes, we have to give them another notice about the new deductions. And so they change their 401k voluntary contribution. Well, I guess we have to give them another new set of notices as to what the deduction is even though they already filled out a form that told us what we were going to deduct. Um, sorry, I do let my bias show a little bit. <laughs> some of the time here. It gets frustrating. Um, so the amount of the deductions, we have to tell people the regular days they're going to get paid, you know, the 15th or the 31st or the closest business day, all that kind of thing. So if you haven't done it yet as an employer, you want to be looking at the documentation that you give to new employees. Keep in mind, that every time something changes, you're going to be giving a new notice, and you know it can be kind of confusing. By the way, you know um, we've we've done a nice little summary flyer, which Marblehead here didn't think of bringing along. Um, but if, if you know if you give me your card, or Chris from my office is here as well, give her your card, and we can send you a copy of this kind of high-level summary of some of these things to be keeping in mind. So the law went into effect, it was July 1, yep. and it was pretty quick. Um, you know, for our company, we took a look at it. Um, you know, we have, we have employees in 17 states, so only one of our 17 states is affected here. So we tried to figure how can we get in compliance as quickly as we can. Um, it, so we took a short-term approach, knowing that we would revisit and design something that is probably a little bit more sustainable for us in the long term. But in the short term, we, the state does provide a, an example notice, and so we are using the state's um, form for the time being. If you're, if you're fortunate enough that you have an HR software system for your applicant tracking or your onboarding, um, most of them have a library of forms, and ours did. So we were able to wrap it right into our electronic onboarding of our employees. And a lot of smaller em employers don't have that convenience, and so of course it's going to be paper. But the state's form is, you know, it's, it does a nice job. I mean, it's 
We've got it all laid out for you, so it's going to work in the long term. Um, our practice always was, uh, once you're hired, you know, we do issue you a hire letter that explains the terms of your employment. So this is really just a bit more robust, and it's just a supplementary form. So we tried to tried not to overcomplicate it and tried to keep it simple. As far as the ongoing notices, though, when it comes down to a change, I can honestly say we haven't quite figured that one out yet. Um, we're hopeful and optimistic that eventually the state will allow, you know, if you have an electronic HR system where employees have access to their records at all time and they can see the history and they make requests, I'm hoping that that will suffice rather than always issuing out written notices, um, but we'll, we'll see. So to be honest, we haven't quite figured out how we're going to keep on top of that one yet, um, but we're getting there. Yeah. Are you obtaining the signatures each time? Yeah, so in the initial notice, of course, electronic signature that they received it. And my understanding is that's the case on all the different notices that they have to sign. <laughs> That's that to me. I thought was a little unclear. In <laughs> it is completely unclear. Uh, written notice is included in a lot of statutes in terms of requirements, but written notice doesn't mean the same thing in every context. And this statute does not define written notice, which to an old timer like me shouldn't be necessary. Written notice means it's, you know, something like this that somebody actually assigned. Um, it is, generally speaking, we think it is better to err on the side of caution. There is nothing like a piece of paper that doesn't get lost, you know, that, that has that signature on it and you can pull it out of the employee's file or a separate file that you're keeping. It seemed to me, you know, as, as we looked at um, the state's uh, website and, and all the FAQ responses that the state has provided, I mean, they're giving themselves a lot of wiggle room here. It seems pretty ambiguous. I, I'm sure there's a lot of scrambling going on behind the scenes to try to figure out this, this detail. So, you know, we're, we're going to do our best to tr try to uh, comply with it, knowing that, you know, and, and hopeful that as time goes on, it'll become a bit more clear. But or go away. I mean, it does say the answer, you know, <laughs> handbooks could suffice, but yet, you know, so, and we do have a, we do have a practice of employees acknowledging handbook every year and that type of thing. So, uh, keep our fingers crossed. Uh, next topic for Brandon. So I learned a little bit of something this morning as well. So can you kind of go over uh, a little bit of what the difference is between a true review versus an audit, right? So people get, when people send CPAs a document or numbers and the CPAs give them something back, they often assume that the, the CPA is giving them the absolute assurance that those numbers are correct. Well, you have, you have to be careful about what you're asking a CPA to do. <coughs> Um, lots of times when you're getting some type of assurance on your financial statements, it's usually dictated by some type of loan agreement. Um, usually the, the banker will require an audit or review. And an audit is much more intense and it, re it requires us to actually give an opinion on your financial statements. A review does not. We're basically saying in a review, we're not aware of anything wrong. There could be something wrong, but we're not actually looking, we're asking you to pull a bunch of documents and, and we're not sampling. Um, it's not nearly the amount of work and assurance um, that an audit would be. I'm going to stand up here because I'm tall. But an audit in terms of assurance <laughs> would be up here. A review would be about down here and then a compilation is slightly below that. We're just taking your, a compilation, we're just compiling your numbers and putting them into a financial statement and giving them to you. A review, we're asking some questions. But an audit is where we're actually digging into all your balances. Um, you know, you, you need to be organized in, in terms of having your documents in, in, in order because we're going to be asking to pull all kinds of, all kinds of different things. Um, you really have to be prepared for, for an audit. When you, when you ask for an audit, make sure you, you set clear expectations as to what that means. And really, it means getting your books up to date, um, reconciling all your accounts uh, timely. It, it, it really requires you to take a, 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 rev a review of your company and and make sure you have documented your processes and controls. How would you, well, if something was wrong, how would you know? You should be able to answer that question as a business owner, as a bookkeeper, as a controller. And it, if you can't, maybe, maybe there's a control missing, um, missing there. And as an auditor, when we come in, a lot of the pitfalls we, we see is that 
companies, small, uh, like I said, we, we work with a lot of family-owned businesses that are smaller. There's a lot of segregation of duties issues that, becomes, that can become an issue during audit. And as a business owner, you really want to eliminate um, those issues just for your own peace of mind, really. When, when one person is doing so much of the financial record keeping, therein lies a risk that something could be going wrong. And if you, if you don't have the segregation of duties, would you ever, would you ever catch that? Um, so it, it's, it's putting, documenting your process and, processes and controls and, and being prepared that if someone were to come in you, come in here and, and ask how things work, that you could explain that to them and show, well, here's, you know, here's our reconciliation, here's the, here's the process that we, that we go through to complete it, here's our review process to make sure it's actually accurate. That's all part of an, an audit. And as you're coming, we're coming down near your, near your end, make sure you're clear on what, the, what your bank loan says that you're required to have. <laughs> We had, just last month, a client um, came back to us and said, the compilation you gave me, the banker, that's not what they're looking for. And we're like, well, what does the loan doc say? And it says reviewed financial statements. Well, that's a whole different level of, of work that we'd have to do then. So be clear what the expectations are with your, with your banker. And then talk to your accountant, too. Like, what, what does this mean? My banker's asking me for a review. He's asking me for an audit. How do, how do I, what, is it, what, what kind of work does this involve and what are the expectations in, in terms of us being able to complete this project successfully because they can go sideways real fast. I'm glad you mentioned the, the bank requirement because yep. most of those bank forms do say audit, mm -hmm. whether it's a $5,000 loan or a $5 right. million dollar loan. And what the bank, but banks aren't the only place where as a practical matter, us business people run into the distinction and don't pay enough attention to it. A lot of contracts, especially in the sale of a business, you know, talk about future financial reports that a seller who is carrying some of the financing, they may call for an audit. Um, but that's not what anybody is really expecting, and mm -hmm. certainly the buyer isn't expecting to pay the big bill for a true audit. And, you know, some of these things just go and nobody pays any attention to them, and it's never a problem <coughs> until it becomes a problem, and then you have a party waiving their contract saying you were supposed to be giving me a, you know, a, a, an audit, you haven't been, I'm declaring a default, I'm calling the loan, and you end up in court, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say best practices is uh, keep your books in order as if you were preparing for an audit. Yeah. Just, just to keep your, your business razor sharp and, and you'll, you'll always, mm -hmm. it, it, just, it gives you peace of mind, you always know what your numbers are because they're, you know what they're at, you can rely on your numbers, they're timely, and, from a control perspective, it, it just reduces the risk of any type of misappropriation or fraud. I mean, you don't want you don't want to give any. Not that your employees are dishonest, but you don't want to give any type of incentive or opportunity or just just there's there's you know three stools to the or three legs to the fraud triangle: incentive, opportunity, and rationalization. You don't know, you don't know what they're always thinking. You don't know what's going on in their personal life. Just don't put that opportunity out there. Put controls in place so that that, that, that doesn't happen. Yeah, so document retention is, is depending on what, what kind of uh, state the, the documents are, are in, could be difficult. If, if everything's organized and you can pull supporting documents for, for your balance sheet, that shouldn't be too much of an issue. If you have inventory, that could be, that creates another issue too, because if you're, if you're, if you're preparing, if you need an audit, um, inventory, assuming it's significant, has to be counted. Um, oftentimes, if, if this is going to make it a little technical here, but if, if we, if auditors have not, haven't counted the inventory in the past, um, and you ask for an audit this year because of looking at selling your company, oftentimes we can only we can count the inventory that date, but we can't give an opinion on the income statement. We can do a review of the income statement, but we because we didn't count the, because we have not counted the inventory in the past, we we can't say that the beginning balances on your beginning balance sheet were correct. So we can say we can review that we can review the income statement but we can't give you an opinion on it, it'd just be an opinion on the ending balance sheet. So, um, you know, if, if, if you're at a stage in your business life cycle where, you, where selling might be, might be an option in the near future, maybe what, we, what, uh, what accountants can do or what auditors can do is just start counting inventory, and that's the only procedure you have to do. So 
I'm not doing an audit, I'm not doing a review this year, but I want auditors to come in and count the inventory because then going forward when it comes time we actually want an audit, they can do a full opinion on the, on the income statement and the, and the financial statements as a whole. So they can do balance sheet, income statement, which is more useful probably for a buyer if they have um, an opinion on the full financial statements than just an opinion on the, on the balance sheet. Very good. So for Peggy, so whenever I have anybody from associate with HR in the room, I feel like these days somehow the conversation always floats over to recruitment and uh, retention of employees and attracting new employees. So uh, can you kind of speak to uh, some of your best practices that you guys do at Midwest Dental? You guys are pretty active in, in that field. So, so um, uh, one of our uh, primary strategic initiatives is the hiring of dentists and hygienists. Those are our two provider categories. Uh, they are um, the two categories of jobs where we can bill for services, so they're absolutely critical to our business, and they're absolutely in short supply. And there's, so there's lots of demand, high competition, um, very difficult um, environment to recruit in. Um, Long-term recruitment of dentists, it begins when they start with dental school. And so, um, we have we employ um, actively partner with our marketing department and we're uh, adopted you know marketing best practices in our talent acquisition recruitment area um, we're active on digital we're uh, growing active in social media we're not quite where we want to be with that but um, that is going to be our 2020 focus is to build a very robust social media presence uh, to support our recruitment efforts uh, we have taken pains over the last year to really dive into what is our employment value proposition, what is it, how do we differentiate ourselves, how do we marry that with our consumer brand to our employment brand. Um, so really taking a look at um, how do we get noticed in, the, in a very crowded field. Um, how do we draw attention to ourselves and create brand awareness first and foremost and then try to engage with candidates. So, um, you know, you'll certainly see job ads out there for us. We're on Indeed and we're on all the different posting boards, but there's a whole lot of work that we're doing aside from that to try to drive just even brand awareness of so that people think about us when they're thinking about a job. Um, much more activity going on there than past years, you know, t in many years ago when you could just place an ad or you'd hold a job fair, or things like that. You know, the, the way of our business is we're very scattered. We don't have geographic um, uh, density. You know, we run small dental practices that are scattered across 17 states. So um, we can't go into a market and physically do presence so we do a lot of our work it's very much digital and yes it's very much brand driven um, so sometimes to the point of frustration those marketing folks just they're diligent about brand um, so we we get into some interesting conversations sometimes um, between HR and marketing but but um, it, but it's absolutely social media marketing that type of things the other thing I would say is um, we were talking earlier about how short attention spans are, you know, people want things in short snippets. And they certainly want that in the recruiting as well. Send me a text, don't send me an email. I want, you know, engage with me that way. Um, I want it to move fast. I want things very quickly. And we're seeing an increasing what's, you know, now the term is ghosting, where they go silent. And that's definitely happening. And so we're trying to combat that by just moving things along quicker. Let's get them to hire and get them to start faster so that we don't have that potential to go. Sure. I think one of the unique perspectives you bring as well is that you're in so many different markets. Are you seeing anything that's any necessarily different in other markets that's, that's aside from the Twin Cities that might be working in certain areas? That you've learned to adapt to yeah I mean when when you recruit in different areas you you know the unemployment rate can vary by area right and and sometimes it depends on uh, where the schools are so for hygienists um, you know we have our most of our practices are in the state of Wisconsin that's where the company grew up um, and they have five hygienist schools um, 
you know, we're, we're pretty much have to be, um, we're dependent on them largely because hygienists don't have the, they're not as apt to relocate as a dentist is. And yeah, Wisconsin before our other states started to show, you know, a real tightness in the market. We first experienced it there. And, you know, and it's hard sometimes you just, you're not quite sure what you're experiencing when you're not getting the candidates that you want. It's not until more time goes on where you start to realize, okay, this is really what's happening in the market. Now we're starting to see that go on in other markets as well. Um, yeah, and you know, we, we are mostly growing out on the East Coast and people operate differently out on the East Coast. <laughs> So, uh, you know, New Jersey, and I can agree with that. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, you know, we just have to adapt to the style sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. So, for as we're starting to think about the end of 2019 as we head into 2020, one of the big things I was thinking about what do we need to be prepared for? What are you guys seeing coming down the pike that's changing as we flip the calendar to the new year that we can start planning today to make sure we're all well ready to go when that calendar flips? Jim? Oh, that was would, a very menacing chuckle. I'm not sure. I... <laughs> well, it, the mind boggles at what legislatures and city councils and the U.S. House and Senate can throw at us, and I'm sure they'll surprise us. Um, you know, one of the, the changes that will affect um, people at, that we know about will be the new wage and hour law rules uh, out of federal regulations that take effect on the uh, first of January goes in large part to who's eligible for um, overtime compensation. I've read different estimates. I don't know what you've seen. They're all over the board. The one I've seen quoted the most often, which probably doesn't mean it's accurate, but about 1.3 million people who are presently exempt from um, overtime will suddenly be eligible for overtime. So it's not a bad idea to review the company's payroll, job duties, positions people are in, and you know, assess who right now you assume is not eligible for overtime compensation who may be under the new rules. Um, complicated topic, it's very fact specific, depends on the different job classifications, the duties that people have, and of course their compensation, the supervisory power, it's a long list of things. So on the theory of why leave well enough alone, you know, changes have been made. Um, I think there are two other things that they're not new in terms of running businesses, but over the last couple of years in particular, they've become more of a concern. They've kind of come to the forefront, and I think that trend will continue. One is the uh, increasing, increasingly complex but also specific rules about retaining records. Um, it used to be that especially small businesses would keep whatever their records were regarding their, their product sales, the services they offered, their employment uh, records, until the file cabinet got full and then you'd start to call. Um, well, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, courts have become increasingly persnickety about uh, if you're in a legal dispute, you know, who's got the records? Gee, if something got thrown away one month before the lawsuit started, there will probably be an ad adverse inference taken that you threw that document away because you were trying to hide something. May or may not be true. So we are increasingly pushing clients uh, to be intentional about their record keeping and their record destruction. So it's a policy, like everything else. Rules that the company will follow that gives them a objective basis to say this kind of agreement or this, this kind of document related to contracts we're going to keep for this period of time, these employment records we're going to keep for this period of time, um, and then actually follow the policy. Then you have a defense to say we threw that document away a month ago because it had reached that point that we have consistently followed for whatever the time period is, and at least in theory that, well, that'll certainly reduce the risk of there being an adverse inference drawn or that you run into problems. There's a corollary to that too, which is uh, federal and Minnesota court rules have expanded to allow parties to a lawsuit to put a hold, uh, in quotation marks, on records that might be related. So lawyers, when lawsuits start nowadays, send out 
uh, a notice saying you don't you dare throw anything away that could have any tangential relationship to this dispute. And it's amazing how often litigators have come from my firm, come down and talk to me and say, you're not going to believe what XYZ company the defendant in this case did. They threw away their records two weeks after I sent out the notice. It's like a clarion call. Let's, oh my gosh, we better pretend we didn't get this. Um, you know, I'm exaggerating to make the point, and because it's easier to laugh than it is to cry. But if you, you know, people need to be trained that if you get that kind of a notice, executives need to know that if we're get, heading in the direction of getting in a dispute, let's be careful and actually be thinking about this instead of getting something they don't understand and throwing it away. So that, that's one of the things that is increasingly a concern. Uh, and the other is the whole area of protecting uh, what we can loosely call intellectual property rights. When I was in law school in the dark ages, when we were still using papyrus reeds, um, <laughs> intellectual property was a short course. You know, the, the, everybody knew there was something called patents, but unless you were going to be a patent attorney and then the law firm that hired you would train you, yeah, I mean, that was about it. Well, everything we do nowadays is intellectual property based. A, a couple of you who I met you know, just today, wh what do you do? You're, you're, you're coaches, you're consultants. What you really are selling is your knowledge base, your, the practices and the information, the ways of dealing with things you've developed over time. That's your valuable intellectual property. And by and large, businesses, even though they're getting more and more sophisticated, still do a crummy job of protecting it. So appropriate provisions in employment contracts about the assignment of opportunities and intellectual property that are developed in the course of your work is an important part of the employment process that it never used to be. But it's still not addressed very often, as often as it should be. We'll put it that way. Um, protective provisions on your website, in your contracts, uh, in the uh, publicity materials you put out, everything needs disclaimers, needs uh, the copyright claim, um, and, and needs other protective provisions. A, a good friend of mine um, used to be in product placement marketing. So he went around to consumer-oriented Fortune 500 companies and pitched incentive programs to get retailers to sell huge quantities of paper towels and other consumer goods. And he got to be really irritated because he was very good at this, but he'd often encounter a company, he'd go in and meet with the big honcho of marketing, there'd be six or seven peons with the guy, they'd listen carefully, say, that's a wonderful plan, I'll get back to you. And as soon as Mark left, the, the, the big cheese would turn around and say, he's got a great idea, go do it. Well, you know, so I outlined for him some protective measures, notices as part of his PowerPoints because we have to keep things short. <laughs> Notice I'm not doing that. I'm talking at ridiculous length. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, he'd have these notices on the PowerPoints. He'd have his notices when he handed things out. All of his writing had the copyright notice. It reduced the amount of, shall we say, um, idea appropriation, but uh, it still happens, but at least he took some measures. And of course, you have to balance what you can do to protect yourself versus what turns off your customers, inherent problem. The importance of IP is not going away, and the importance, and increasing importance of protecting it to the extent we can is still something that we really need to pay attention going forward. Very good. Brandon. There's nothing necessarily that new. I, should, I shouldn't say that. This is um, dorky gap stuff, accounting <laughs> stuff. But uh, the standard setters, they're always tinkering and making things more complex than they need to be. But they issued new revenue standards um, that were effective 19 for businesses, and they're issuing new lease standards that are effective for 2021, although they keep on delaying it every single year. Um, that will impact your financial, that will impact companies' financial statements. So I think it's more than anything, it's just asking your accountants how these might affect your financial statements. And if you have loans, again, going back to any type of covenants you might have with the bank, um, <coughs> discussing with the bankers what your financial statements might look like after these new standards become effective, because it could impact some type of liquidity ratios that, that could call, um, cause your, your debt to be out of compliance with, with the covenants. 
Um, those are just the, the, stand, the county standards that are effective. The big, I mean, the tax code was overhauled last year, so again, probably if you haven't had conversations with your accountants, you, sh you should be having those. Um, one thing that's kind of exciting for, for us in, in our industry, but I think for businesses as well, will be the, the kind of the road that artificial intelligence takes and what that means for, for companies being able to use data analytics to, to kind of steer their decision-making process. Uh, I don't know, that's kind of a, a vague way of putting it, but I, I think if you look at it in terms of like a baseball game, it's probably like the second inning of a, a nine-inning game, and it could be 16-inning games. I, I don't know how long it, it takes before um, the effects of, of data analytics and companies' ability to, the big companies are probably are already using it, but the smaller companies and, and being able to, to recognize the analytics and, and use those to, to steer their decision-making process in their companies, I think is, is coming. Not in, not in 20, but it, it's coming and something to just constantly be um, on the lookout for because there are, there are articles and uh, if you Google them, there's all kinds of things written about how artificial intelligence is going to shape the business industry. And so just to be, be aware of that. Great. Peggy, from your perspective, what do you got? Yeah, I want to piggyback on what was said earlier about the exempt, non-exempt. Um, you know, there are certain issues and concerns that have just been consistent throughout my whole HR career and one of them is why you know why are some employees salaried and others hourly and why can't I pay my my employee on my team salaried because that's how the person wants to be paid and it's probably the, one of the most misunderstood areas of employment terms um, there is it, it, as as was mentioned there's there um, the Fair Labor Standards Act which is what dictates exemption from overtime is has rules and it has these tests that you have to apply and they're not clear-cut you have to use some judgment and interpretation and um, every job is is slightly different so um, you know, if, if you don't have an internal HR expert in your company, I would highly advise if you're trying to decide that you bring in someone who's versed in, in working in those tests that can look at it for you and help you. Because if you do um, error in making someone exempt, salaried, when, you know, perhaps the government would look at it differently, the penalties can be pretty steep. Um, you pay a pretty big price for that error. Um, so it, it's important and there has for a long time that law just sat dormant they didn't really do much with it and it's been recent years now where it's been being looked at so trying to keep up with what's the most recent um, discussion going on and what does it look like how the how the rules are going to change um, the other area that I would say to keep your eye on is um, LOA le paid leave of absence laws um, that are more and more being um, done at the state and local levels. And so if you operate in different states, you have to comply with not only the federal paid leave laws or unpaid leave laws, like FEMLA, but you have to apply, uh, comply with state and local. And um, that's becoming more and more complex. And as an organization, we're actually looking to outsource that service. Um, because it's becoming so complex we can't keep up with it and um, we feel like we're at risk of being non-compliant. So um, keep your eye on that. Great, great. Stick with you, Peggy. I know one of uh, year end, there was a past life. I used to dread the end of the year because that meant in January I had 21 performance reviews to do and that would be my entire month of January. So can you go over some of the best practice that you're seeing in performance reviews and how that relates maybe to merit increases and, and what you're seeing in that area? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I, I like the idea that you do a performance review kind of towards the beginning of the year, though I know it's burdensome. I, I think, you know, that's kind of the t typical time of year where people are taking stock of their lives. <laughs> And they're saying, okay, what did I achieve last year in my personal life and in my professional life and what do I want to change? And, and so I think it's natural for them to think about, yeah, my professional life and am I getting out of my current employment situation? What do I want to get out of it? So as an employer, I don't know that you want to necessarily miss that opportunity to tap into that line of thinking, at least with your top performers, right? The last thing you want them to do is be thinking, well, maybe there's not a future for me here, or maybe I need to make a change. And you're late in coming to the game to talk about, hey, I see a future for you here. So to me, it's kind of nice if you, um, if you, if you don't have your former performance review cycle 
tied you know, early part of the year, at least be honing in on who are my top performers, what am I thinking about for them for this next year, where do I see their career going with my firm, um, and make sure you're having those conversations with those people early on. You know, make sure you're in, on, ongoing so that they know. I, um, more and more, I think, kind of back to that at short attention span, and we read about uh, the younger generations coming into the workforce, they want, they want to move faster, they want more feedback. So I think there's a lot of, um, I know we're, we're talking a lot more of how can we give kind of ongoing coaching. It's not so much about a performance evaluation any longer, it's about an ongoing dialogue. Make sure that leaders are having those conversations ongoing with their employees about how are you doing? What do we see for you in the future? That type of thing. Do you see any advantages of going from a the sort of the calendar year to maybe perhaps their anniversary date, their hiring? We actually just did the opposite. Okay. We moved away from anniversary to um, uh, a, um, <coughs> a common review. There's pros and cons to each. Uh, one of the, you know, the disadvantages of a common is it is, yeah, you're doing it all at one time. You're trying to push through a lot of activity in a short amount of time, whereas an anniversary you can stage that differently. It, it, um, the reason we went to common was it can drive more focus as an organization, and we tie it to our strategic initiatives and our goal setting as an organization. Um, that kicks off in the beginning of the year like that. So we can drive alignment to what we're trying to achieve as an organization. Um, but yes, it's a pretty big burden on our leaders to try to get it all done. So even from a culture per, or from a, a culture perspective of making that transition, was there any kind of financial burden that you did to prepare for that? Because instead of you know dripping it throughout the year, you're kind of concentrating. Sure. I mean, we ran we ran the numbers, uh, prorating people who's you know who's going to have to get a partial increase this year um, because they had a late in the year increase last year type of thing, and then who's going to have to wait. So there can. You have to run the numbers and see what that impact is. But. How do you differentiate, um, or do you differentiate? So we get employees that say, I want a review, I want a review rate. Basically, they want a raise. <laughs> they don't really want to hear what you have to say. Right. So do you connect the two, or is there a direct association, or do you do scoring, or how do you? Yeah, so presently today, our merit increases are tied to the, re the review cycle. And we were just talking about that yesterday, whether or not we wanted to continue with that. Yeah. Okay, and so you. Everybody gets across the board this, you know, April 15th. It's not, um, we do merit. So, okay. Yeah, but not. Um, so your, your not increase happens at this time of the year, but not necessarily your performance review. Our increase is really, the King's a little unique, but we, um, <laughs> you get a, re, you get a raise, it's very intermittent, it's very okay. non-structured, it's okay. more based on solely performance. Wow. We don't. Our owner doesn't believe in putting a number on a human being. He's very anti-performance management. So I've had to develop this whole one-on-one -on -one meeting script for a manager. So it's more of a mentor-mentee, coach mm -hmm. kind of player mm -hmm. type of a. So it's a very interactive dialogue, but not scoring because there's so okay. many different barriers or risks um, for the lawyer in the room. Um, in in, there's a lot of biases and things that could yeah. potentially fall in. And you could yeah. lose a very good employee because they feel like they, yeah. they are defeated. And so I walk a fine line. I know with yeah. all my HR background and history and, and, and the validity of a performance review, yeah. but I also know the reality is, um, I, but I believe in that, that when you said instant and, and c continuous, that's yeah. what we should be having. There's no surprises. It's really a, um, you know, what what you need to work a help with. You have the right tools. You know how yeah. things changed <coughs> since the last time we met. You know, just having it a fluid right. conversation. Yeah, and support, and I would imagine you do a fair amount of training of your leaders in order to have them have a meaningful conversation. Well, and that's just it. You have to <coughs> supervisor who really is uncomfortable or, you know, just doesn't yeah. have yeah so when I joined our organization they historically had um, really given everyone the same increase we call it the peanut butter approach right you just spread the same percentage across everybody um, and the local leader 
really wasn't equipped to um, uh, do a pay for performance type of model. And so we've been, you know, kind of baby stepping our way towards that, trying to um, trying to to take better advantage of the dollars we're spending and gearing them towards the people that are truly our top performers, but again, not having local leaders that we felt were really prepared themselves to have that conversation. So moving towards that. One of the things our firm does actually is we have a career counselor program and a mentoring program. Nice. So the career counselor would be you check in quarterly with your counselee to, to see how things are going and where they're at with their goals. And to, and to give any feedback as to yeah. what they're, so in their file they have performance reviews and our, and our job's slightly different, but <clears throat> if they're on a, working on a project, they would have performance reviews for those projects if it exceeded uh, a certain amount of hours. So it was big enough they could actually get decent feedback and work on their goals. That would be in their file, you, you talk about that quarterly in their file as to how those projects went and, and how they did on, on those projects in comparison to what their goals were. And our mentoring program is basically for the staff or for the employee to voice any type of concerns. They can do it in the career counselor with the career counselor too, I guess if they, if they feel comfortable, that's usually a person in the same department. The mentoring program is a person outside of their department generally, nice. so they feel mm -hmm. free to share information or any, you know, any qualms about might, what might be going inside their own department. They can talk to someone outside of the department mm -hmm. that's unrelated and you know, hopefully unbiased as to what they're doing. Right. Yeah, I have heard of more companies moving to that project-based assessment rather than a, you know an annual performance and I'd like that particularly if, of course if your your work is more project-based that wouldn't necessarily work in our environment right, right. Um, in a dental clinic but but certainly in, in a firm like yours nice. well, and if I can jump in I work at SDK with Brandon and it, like he's in audit I'm in tax so project-based for him is a whole lot easier than it is for me because my projects are all, you know, you might spend five hours on a project instead of five weeks on a project. Mm -hmm. So we have different mechanisms in place to kind of help mm -hmm. deal with those differences even within the company. Whatever you do, I gotta have this. Be I was wondering how, much, how long you were gonna stay here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's starting to twitch. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, this Minnesota nice thing is real and I don't know how many times, you know, I've, I, over the years I've talked, and continuing, or, you know, you, you talk to the a head, a head of HR, the decision maker, we've got to let Joe go. I'm a little concerned about it, you know, he had that health problem two years ago and this, that, and the other thing. And he's got, and it's because of performance, right? And is there a word of documentation of poor performance? And the answer almost inevitably is no, because the supervisor hasn't been trained to be honest. They're afraid of criticizing because they go out Friday after work and have a beer with Joe. And employers have a real problem in those kinds of situations. Not doing the employee any favor for the two or three years where a festering issue was allowed to sit. Certainly not doing the company any good. And not that anybody cares about the lawyer, but if we have to be involved in the case, you're not making our job easier. So, you know, tact, yes. Um, being accurate, essential. But if something isn't going well when you're doing that project review or you're doing whatever interval review your folks do, it needs to be included, it needs to be documented. Right. So I have two last questions. My first one's gonna be uh, for the three of you. I think um, you know, compliance and regulatory standards change all the time. So from a business perspective, what's your best practice to stay current to make sure that you're in line to meet all those standards? And let anybody can start. Call your friendly lawyer. <laughs> no. That was kind of a softwise. <laughs> no, I mean, there's a lot of educational opportunities out there, trade organizations in your industry. Um, uh, the good ones, you know, get some of this information out there, belonging to uh, peer groups, um, you know, like the employers forum, some of those kinds of organizations, and read everything you can. Yep. Yeah, if, if your advisors have any type of educational seminars or roundtables, some of that, I know we host quarterly roundtables, we do education for our clients, and you guys probably do the same thing, send out newsletters. 
just, just stay, stay on top of those things. Attend an MD if you can make them. There's usually pretty good information in there, and you, you get to network with uh, you know, other business people, too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I have anything else to add. We rely very heavily on our auditors, our, our lawyers, our insurance brokers, um, our insurance consultants, for sure, um, keep us uh, up to date on what we should be doing with our programs and so forth. We rely heavily on that. Mm -hmm. We try our best to stay with like SHRM, our professional association and those types of things to, to keep. It'd be nice if there was like one source and you sure, could just right. go to mm -hmm. one source, yeah. but you really do have to have a whole number of people in your organization all connected and helping each other and feeding that information to each other. Very good, very good. So when it comes to, you know, I think of M&A and succession planning, so how do you, how do businesses uh, value themselves? What's the, what are some of the things they need to think about when it comes time to putting a price tag on all the hard work, blood, sweat, and tears that they go through? And then what are some of the legal things that they should be mindful of at a high level? So Brandon, I'll start with you maybe. Uh, from a valuation perspective, I mean, it, having, right now, right now there's a lot of money in the market. I think companies are selling for very high multiples. Um, I've done a fair number of valuations in the last, last few months, and you know, business business owners always think their company is probably worth. They're never going to agree probably with the number that we stick on it, and we're usually doing a, a fair market value versus what a strategic buyer might pay for the company. But you know, cash flow is cash flow is key. Um, you know, if you have a, a strong history of cash flow and, and, and growth, and and you have a a strong management team, I think that, that that's another factor that plays into the value of a business. That, that's not just one person running the whole show because if that person gets hit by a bus tomorrow, the company's probably in a lot of trouble. So um, having, having a strong management team, um, having accurate accounting, having accurate numbers. If someone were to come in and, and they see all these different spikes going on in your numbers throughout the year or over the years or on a monthly basis, they're probably gonna question the accuracy of your numbers and, and not gonna be willing to pay as much for the company. Um, the industry you operate in has 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 a decent amount to do with with what your your company might be worth. You know, um, right now I think the this, the technology industry um, is very 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 high, um, a lot higher multiples there than you might see in like a manufacturing type of industry, um, and people are paying for a lot for for intangibles. Um, I'm not going to claim to be an, ex be an expert on valuing uh, intangibles, but I think there's a there is a lot, a lot of, a lot of money there. Um, the the, num the I mean, having having accurate numbers, I think the management team having a strategic plan, being able to show what your what your site vision is for the company in the future, being able to forecast um, where the company is going and and how you expect to get there, I think is key to to having a you know a good valuation of your business. Great, Jim. From a legal perspective, what are things that they should put in that plan? Try not to be involved in an active lawsuit. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that scares. Step, yeah, that scares people. Um, <laughs> everyone wants to know what a company is worth, and it, despite the accounting industry's best efforts to find different ways to value businesses, you can find a formula for anything. And, and, and that's great and it gives you a range, an idea of the range that a business should sell for. Um, from the legal point of view though, a business is worth what the seller and the buyer agree on. Agree on. And so a lot of those intangibles become very important. The buyer wants to know that the successful company can continue to be successful. Now here we have, in very, very general terms, two groups of buyers. We have buyers who are in the industry and are trying to you know, build their business by buying another electrical firm, for example. And so they're concerned about client base, they're concerned about revenue, his historic growth, and will the people be sticking around. Then you've got the venture capitalist types, That's my, that is an actual term, I'm using it kind of incorrectly here, where a group of people have pooled a bunch of money together and they want to go off and buy businesses. And they think they can do a better job of running a successful business than the people who've been running a successful business. My experience is they're usually wrong, but um, so they want to maintain the key leadership, 
because they think that the key leadership will be able to do better than they have been just because there are different bosses looking over their shoulders. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So you, be, you need to be careful uh, in, in who you're marketing to and be aware of what their expectations are, what they're really looking for. But from a legal point of view, we, want, we, we don't want to be, have a history of litigation. We don't want to have a history of, of troubled employees filing claims with the EEOC. You know, you're looking for being able to make the truthful statements that a seller has to make, warranties and representations about the business, that's pretty clean. Um, not a lot of adverse actions out there, not a lot of employee problems, uh, and I'm only, I'm not joking when I say, you know, try not to have a pending lawsuit going on. Pretty sage advice. Well, very good. Well, ask, ask well, question, that might mean even paying to settle something mm -hmm. if you don't want to, just to scratch it from the lid and be done with it. Well, you, you just opened the Pandora's box of a rant I could go into about, uh, yeah, well, um, you know, the, the, the problem with litigation is not the runaway juries that politicians talk about. Um, it's the way that the system has evolved to make settling cases through litigation incredibly expensive, time-consuming, stressful, and you know, it puts people in the very bad position of having to, either they're going through alternative dispute resolution, which has a whole bunch of issues of its own, uh, they're in a lawsuit and they have to get out of it, so they end up having to pay something that they shouldn't have to. Um, it's just kind of a nightmare. So a savvy buyer or a buyer with a savvy attorney is going to be looking for a history of problems whether they entered litigation or not. And it's kind of hard to know for sure. You get warranties from the selling company about we haven't been involved in litigation in the last 10 years, that kind of thing. But there are searches now that can be done electronically to show that whether or not a party has been involved in a lawsuit over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And so ideally, litigation is not fun. There are times you have to be involved in it. There are times you're a defendant. There are times you're a plaintiff and you just can't let something go. But it, it's costly, it's expensive, and for most business people, you want to avoid it. Um, yeah, settling a case has a lot to be said if you're trying to sell your business. You have one less thing. You're still going to have to explain that the case was there, what it was about, how it was resolved, <coughs> why, in your opinion, it was resolved. Be careful about settlements that have confidentiality clauses, which is increasingly popular, because then you're violating the settlement if you tell somebody what happened. So you got to be a little careful in the process of settling the case to make sure that you don't complicate your life down the road. Very good. Well, with that, uh, any questions from you guys? So we have a few minutes here and time for a couple. Nothing? So in closing, is there any last minute ideas or thoughts that you guys would like to share on the panel? Can I pick your brain? <laughs> got what we got. Well, very good. Well, I want to thank Peggy, Brandon, and Jim for sharing their time and expertise with us today. So thank you for that. Yeah, I want to thank our location. And if you haven't seen the view behind us, please take a look and take a picture. It's a uh, perfect fall, uh, fall scene out there. So I think Rush Creek, again, thank our sponsors here, uh, both uh, School Marketing, uh, Compass Realty. You guys couldn't see Mike. He had a baby. Well, his wife had a baby <laughs> yesterday, so he is able to join us today. Uh, and then again, my, I'm Rob Stark with Edward Jones. So I thank you all for coming and uh, continue to con network and, and stick around for a little while if you'd like. So thanks. <laughs>